Hello, everyone. This is uh, Redmond Weisenberger from the Mises Institute of Canada. And uh, after a brief hiatus, we're bringing back the Austrian uh, <laughs> the Austrian AV Club. And just a little bit of announcement. Uh, I got this, uh, this document from my grandfather. Uh, he had purchased it a long time ago. It's called What is Communism? It's produced by the uh, Novosti Press Agency Publishing House. And we're going to be releasing this. And it's sort of scary how much the uh, the rhetoric within this document uh, reflects that of the um, sort of modern social democrats. And the other thing we're going to be releasing soon is uh, Class Struggle, the board game. Stefan, uh, I think you'd enjoy playing this. I'd love to. It's great. <laughs> it Better was... than Mon Monopoly. It was produced by a Marxist uh, teacher at, uh, let me just read back here again. Uh, by New York University and was published by Class, Str Class Struggle Incorporated, 487 Broadway, New York, New York. Uh, there you go. So it's a, it's a very enjoyable game and it teaches you about how capitalists are evil and uh, the workers uh, sell triumph over capitalism. Um, so we're going to be publishing that, uh, sort of just sort of scanning it all in, throwing on PDFs. Just so people can understand, because I think in, in today's world, when you're growing up, you're a, like a millennial or, you know, you're just getting out of university now or just going into university. You don't understand sort of the background, um, you know, why your teachers are teaching Marxism, why your 40 year old teachers still believe in Marxism. Well, things like this. There you go. That's why. Yeah, that's fantastic. You, if you visit the Mises Institute in Auburn, the halls upstairs are just lined with all these old communist propaganda posters. It's fantastic. <laughs> like on the toilet in the back, there's the little red book and, you know, all the communist propaganda. So, it, Oh, for sure. Well, they, they spread it around. And I think that's sort of largely, I mean, you know, the sort of we're going to be speaking about something else. But largely, I think that, uh, you know, for the last 150 years, um, you know, since sort of like the Paris Commune or 1848, there's been this this grand push towards centralization, towards state controls, towards socialism. Um, and of course, in ninth and and during the entire 20th century, from about, you know, well, at least from about you know 1917 on, there was this sort of there was this guiding star that people could point to, and that was the Soviet Union. And of course, in 1989, that fell apart. But you know, we here in the West were already on that that long range push to socialism. And, you know, we continued on that way of socialism, even though the Soviet Union fell apart. And so now we're sort of, you know, when we look at what's happening in the, in Europe right now, essentially what we're seeing is the destruction 20 years on now of the social democratic welfare state, right. That was created within the 20th century, you know, sort of based on the ideas of, of this. I mean, if you look at this book, pretty much everything within it, would be mouthed today by somebody on within Occupy Wall Street, mm -hmm. uh, by somebody who calls them a social de who calls themselves a, a social democrat. You know, all the ideas are right in here. Or some left people. libertarians. Yeah, or yeah, <laughs> some left libertarians. Yeah, and and also, uh, so I understand. Uh, just to begin, I was, did you attend the uh, the Austrian Scholars Conference down in Auburn, Alabama? Oh, I've been there many times. I haven't been. Um... I think in a couple of years, but yes, I've been many times, and uh, I know you have one coming up as, of your own. So, uh. yeah, we're we're actually launching uh, because I think that this is uh, obviously now we've got the situation where I think you know a couple months ago Jeff Tucker posted a, a picture showing that you know Mises dot org was getting something like a million hits a month mm -hmm. or something like some ridiculous number, and all over the world we have Mises institutes popping up. Um, you know, Rothbardian Institutes, Mises Institutes popping up. And um, I think in order to keep that going, we need more scholars conferences, you know, to encourage people within academia uh, to sort of sort of step out of the woodwork. Because honestly, I've encountered here in Canada in the last couple of years, uh, I've noticed that people essentially um, have just, like I said, just popped out of the woodwork. All of a sudden they're coming out and they're saying, yeah, I'm a Rothbardian or I'm an Austrian. Whereas 20 years ago they were teaching, you know, they might be teaching philosophy or they might be teaching economics, but all of a sudden they're like including on their resume or they're, or they're showing up at the Austrian Scholars Conference down in Auburn. And that's how I found out about a bunch of people was because they showed up in Auburn 
I had no idea that they existed, no idea that they considered themselves either libertarian or Austrian or whatnot. But because um, there was this sort of guiding light, there was Mises.org, um, you know, they were willing to step forward and and say, yes, we agree with this point of view that is out there. And Absolutely. That's, and that's exactly what I'm doing here in Canada. Um, by starting Mises Canada, right, I, I've, I've put ourselves forward um, as this place where we can discuss Austrian economics and apply it to the Canadian context. And I think the follow on point to that is that as these, you know, especially, uh, you know, I get a lot of um, students coming to Mises.ca, people in Canadian universities. And I think that what we need to present to them is a place for them in the future so they can say, well, look, if I start studying this, I know there's a conference here in Canada that I can attend where I can present my papers. I can I can share my ideas with like minded people also who are in with this is, you know, this ivory tower, whatever you want to call it, of academia that exists. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we'd love to have you up there. I, I don't know if you'll be able to make it, but it's going to be uh, November 10th. Uh, in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And if you just uh, Google search Toronto Austrian Scholars Conference, you can uh, make it out. Yeah, I've actually looked into it and I'm studying my calendar now to see if I can make it. I would love to make it. It sounds like it's going to be great. Yeah, yeah, no, it's excellent. I think certainly already we've got uh, several Canadians. Again, like I said, these people who have sort of started to come out of the word work. Uh, We've got Glenn Fox, uh, teaches at Guelph. Uh, Lloyd Gerson, who teaches at uh, University of Toronto. Prejag Ratzik. And I think we're also going to have Art Carden up. Um, and I think you know Art Carden, right? I do know Art. Yeah, yeah, a great guy. And funnily enough about Art as well, he's been on the CBC a number of times, um, uh, which is CBC, which is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, our state-run uh, sort of propaganda unit or news unit. Um, and it's funny, funnily enough, though, also in the last couple of months, they've, they've created a whole um, – audio series called The Invisible Hand. So they're actually discussing economics in a fair way on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. That's, which... that's promising. Um, <laughs> do, do you find, I, I've noticed in the uh, Mises America circles in the last, say, 20, 25 years, it's moved pretty substantially in the uh, Austrian anarchist, heavily Rothbardian libertarian direction. Do you what do you find in your Canadian sort of Mises Austrian circles? Is it sort of minarchist or classical liberal or utilitarian or what is it dominated by? Well, I mean, we've we've had a few. Um, well, I'll tell you. I mean, a lot of the people who we have speak at our events um, are definitely you know towards minarchism, towards anarchism. Um, yeah, like Lloyd Gerson came and spoke, and, and he was, you know, I, I would say, uh, he, w- he would say it was uh, Gersonian, but, he, you know, essentially the, the ideas he was talking about were very much Rothbardian ideas. You know, in, in, his, in essence, he was discussing the ideas that, you know, quite clearly the state does not exist. I mean, the state is an artificial construct, right? Um, and yeah, and, and we're definitely, I would say we're definitely sort of uh, trending towards, or at least, I mean, our editorial content is definitely trending towards the Rothbardian anarchist, right? Or you know, our anarcho-capitalist point of view. And, and but they, I mean, you know, when you have your crowds, I've seen some of your uh, your videos with your show, like in the bars and mm-hmm. restaurants, and they're heavily attended. It seems like you have a great turnout. And yeah, it looks yeah. like even if not everyone's on board, they're not turned off by the sort of radical pre principled positions you put out oh no not at all um yeah and we've had and oftentimes we have uh you know easily at every one of our meetings we at least have 30 to 40 people out you know what i mean and they're all very interested in it we have people traveling in from you know smaller towns outside of the the greater toronto area to attend and yeah definitely um we certainly don't uh, occasionally we get i i did have one discussion with somebody about uh environmentalism <laughs> so mm-hmm. sort of had some issues with that mm-hmm. but yeah generally people are very accepting of the ideas um it's more on facebook where i where i where i notice sort of neocons or i or i or i think me maybe some people who might be more termed as um sort of objectivists in some way right 
Uh, but yeah, no, generally uh, people don't have a problem. Uh, it's kind of interesting too because we do have within Canada our own sort of push for uh, what you would call greenbackerism. Um, you know what I mean? When Gary North sort of took on uh, Ellen Brown's um, uh, web of debt. Do you know about that? The no. uh, type of debt and the greenbackers? No. The ones who sort of, they want to get rid of the Fed, but they want to have it sort of completely, you know, government run. Essentially, Congress should decide how uh, much money to uh. print it. Yeah. So we have in, in Canada our own greenbackers. And, and just a little while ago, a, um, a Canadian, uh, a 12 year old Canadian girl uh, basically gave a, a sort of a greenbacker speech and it went viral on YouTube. It sort of had like a million hits or something like that. Yeah. So, so we, um, we had a post on, on, on Mises Canada called calling out a Canadian, I <laughs> call out a 12 year old greenbacker, <laughs> so, um, which, which some people, it, it, yeah. It, I mean, it's kind of funny when you, when you ask a 12 year old to sort of spout these ideas, I don't know that, I don't know it's that they actually understand what, I mean, maybe she, maybe she perfectly understands what she's discussing, but at the same time, I do sort of question the sort of indoctrination that she received, um, leading up to this. And, and at one point she sort of said that she wanted to throw the money changers out of the temple. <laughs> so, so, okay. Good throwaway so, line. Fine. Yeah. You know, like, uh, which is, which is kind of funny because, um, you know, it, there was a uh, Dan Simon at our, at our last uh, Mises Canada meetup was discussing Rothbard's book on, uh, I guess, the Panic of 1816, or you know, the one of these first panics mm -hmm. after the War of 1812, and some of the rhetoric that they used was throw the money changers out of the temple because at, at that point they had a problem where money changers um, would take this sort of this fiat currency and they would, they would exchange it for their local currency and then would take it back to these banks in the East and try to exchange it for gold. Right. So they said the, the U S government actually passed a law <clears throat> saying that specifically money changers couldn't, um, they weren't allowed to exchange their money for gold. Right. And, and then I, and then I asked them a, a legitimate question. I said, do you think that Jesus believed in central banking? And <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but anyways, uh, but more to the point, let's uh, so we're here to discuss uh, net neutrality um, and I guess what it's all about, because I understand there's been a recent I guess there's an ongoing court case around net neutrality. And, and so what is net neutrality? So if you think about the Internet, which is the network with, that we all use that you and I are using right now for this uh, discussion, um, the idea of network neutrality is that there should be rules in place that prevent content providers like the cable companies, the telcos, et cetera, from doing something with the data that goes across their pipes, even though you're paying for it. So for example, th there are different levels of net neutrality. So for example, um, some types of service providers will charge more for a higher level of bandwidth or, or, or speed. Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, that's, discrimination. You shouldn't be able to do that. Well, that type of net neutrality that would prevent you from doing that kind of regulation of, you know, metering of broadband is not that popular because people sort of realize that you should be able to get more broadband the more you pay for it or people that use it more should have to pay more. Uh, mm -hmm. But then there are other types like, for example, let's say that um, I'm using AT&T UVerse for my connection. And I can purchase a telephone plan from them over my data connection. And if I use Skype, I can circumvent that. So they could technically sniff the Skype bits and they could prevent that unless I want to pay for it or, or whatever. Um, so that would be – they would be – So the type they – would, they would say selectively be choosing the type of data – that goes over your internet connection. Yeah, or they'd be blocking it unless you pay a higher rate. So, for example, there's some rumors that the new – um, iPhone 5 that's supposedly coming out, w which will have this FaceTime video connection, mm -hmm. which goes over the data connections on the networks, yeah. which right now can only go over Wi-Fi, excuse me, will technically be able to go over the 3G or 4G connections over, say, AT&T, but AT&T may require you to pay $10 a month extra for that connection. 
And if you don't pay it, then they will detect that connection and block it. So some people say they shouldn't be able to block it. Now, but 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 theoretically, I mean, I mean, on a technical point, something like FaceTime would use higher data, would use would use more data because it's video over yes. Wi-Fi I mean, yeah. or no so, so over three G. If if you use the first, um, you know, the first tier of objections to net neutrality, and you assume that we're going to get over that, that you can charge more for more data usage, then that would solve that problem because then AT and T could just you know, charge you more for more data usage, but they don't want to just do that. They want to do more. So the question mm -hmm. is, should they be able to do that? And you have this sort of two tiered argument. And one is the libertarian argument would be that private companies should be able to do whatever they want as long as they don't violate your rights. And then it's just supply and demand and competition on the market. And, but mm -hmm. then the sort of controlling argument would be that well, these companies have a, a neo, a, a quasi-monopoly position. They shouldn't be able to abuse it, so they can't discriminate. They couldn't discriminate based upon type of data or the content. For example, let's suppose they were sniffing your data, and they don't like your religious messages being shared with your friends, even on email. They could mm -hmm. block that. And so should the law prevent that? So that's one question. But then the reverse is, uh, which is the, uh, the email or, or the, the blog post you and I started talking about. Um, there is an FCC ruling that would force these telecoms and data providers to not block certain types of communications over their networks, even if the company disagrees with it, like if it's you know racist or terrorist related or whatever. Um, and so their argument is that if they are forced by the government to not block content that they don't want to carry – then it's the same as forcing them to speak on these topics. So it's a free speech violation. Okay. So that's the debate right now. So because I think that – because turning back the clock a little bit, we have to look at, I think, what was going on with, say, cable networks or um, telephones. I mean, theoretically, were these types of arguments being made when telephones were first going across the United States? Right. I mean, would could a could a telephone company block listen in on the conversation if they didn't like the conversation that was being held? Um, I mean, did did that issue even come up? Probably. Right. I mean, could could a would a would you ever had a situation in say 1930 or 1940 or 1950 when telephones were being spread across the United States? Did this discussion ever come up where um, you know the the government was afraid that a telephone company would listen in on the conversation that was being had and they would block, they would hang up the phone based on the conversation that two people were having. Because essentially that's the sort of the same. I send an email which has religious content in within it. I, I personally I don't understand why a private company would would address that issue. And and well, did that apply to, to I, I, uh, phones? I think of course the reason why is because the government is trying to get them to, or there or there's a reason for them to because the government, you know incentives or pushing them to do that. Um, I think early on it was in its infancy, and plus it was analog. So right now everything's digital. When it's analog, it disappears. It's not recorded. It's not searchable. Now things are digital. They're, they can be stored, and they can be searched, and you have NSA, NSA wiretaps, CIA wiretaps all over the place. Yeah. Um, so you have this sort of merging or melding of the government with these private companies. Um, so the, the you know the problem is that the, the the government has created these companies that have a quasi oligopolistic presence, right? And they don't have free market power. They have more than free market power, and that is true. It is probably true that AT and T and these other companies would not have the size they do, and the market would not be structured like it is if the government hadn't been messing with the market for the last fifty years. Um, right. But but the solution to that is not to get the government to come in and impose more rules to sort of curtail the power of the monopolies that they've created. It's to get the government out of it because mm -hmm. the government has created the problem in the first place. And if you think about it, in the beginning, uh, the dawn of the radio era, let's say 100, you know, roughly 100 years ago, um, there were common law rights being developed in the FCC in, in the radio spectrum. This was developing naturally without government really involvement, without central legislation. But then in the U.S. at least, 
the FCC was created, and they came in and they just monopolized the whole field. And they said, look, we're going to just stop this organic, spontaneous development of rules of who can transmit mm -hmm. which, which, which you know, signals on which wavelength over which geographic region, and the government just took it over. Yeah. And now the government claims that they are the ones that have the right to grant this privilege for you to broadcast. And if you do it, you have to pay a little fee, and you have to comply by the FCC rules. And they've extended this to the Internet and to television and radio. Yeah. So, well, but in terms of the Internet, there are no... Within the United States, and I know here within Canada, there aren't a lot of. I, I know in Canada we have sort of like hate speech laws, yes. right? Uh, which I don't believe you have in the United States the same. I, I hate and, I hate hate speech laws. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay to say? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So, uh, so but to some extent, there aren't any laws describing what you can uh, publish on the internet, right? right. Beyond, I guess, intellectual property or copyright laws, which is which is a big caveat. I mean, that is becoming a huge issue. I mean, yeah, think, it, think about SOPA, PIPA, ACTA. I think there's a Canadian law professor, Michael Geist, who's been heroic. He's sort of been like the, uh, you know, he's been the uh, uh, what's the Stephen Kinsella? No, no, the Kim dot com. I'm thinking that you know the. Uh, <laughs> The, the, the Julian, San, the San, you know, the guy with the white hair, you know, the guy. Yeah, the, he's been the the WikiLeaks of this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, he, he released the ACTA Treaty, and he's exposed the government machinations on these issues. Um, uh, the, the, the 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 intellectual property excuse has been huge. The government is using it to regulate the internet in a huge way. So I agree. You could say other than that, there's no regulations, but that's a huge source of government regulation. Plus, we have child pornography, uh, gambling, terrorism, yeah. money laundering. It's pretty huge. The government has a lot of tools in their toolbox now that they can use as an excuse to regulate the Internet. To shut down specific websites and, and all that kind of just have, have there been. In terms of takedowns, have there been a lot of takedowns? Uh, there, there have been hundreds or maybe thousands of takedowns, like in the U.S. alone. Uh, you can find these sites that you go to and you see this big seal, this big ominous Nazi-like seal. You know, mm -hmm. a big you know, government, the I, uh, I, ICE, ICE is taking it down. Immigration and Customs Enforcement taking the site down, or some other some other federal agency is taking it down. Yeah, it's 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 horrible. Um, so we're not we're not like a pristine country. We're, I don't know if we're the worst, but a lot of countries are trying to censor what's going on on the internet. Yeah, well, well, actually, in fact, I know in Australia they've actually started to put together. They're trying to actually restrict <clears throat> restrict uh, political speech, not only um, and essentially they they put. In, I had a conversation with a woman uh, named Joanne Nova, who uh, runs a blog. She's sort of a, a global warming skeptic. Uh, and also she's an advocate of sound money and uh, it, it's very interesting. She's, she's essentially an Austrian as well. Um, but she uh, she actually said that the Australian government was trying to put in these laws that would say if you get something more than, you know, 1000 hits a month, then the government can come in and look, look at what you're writing. And I'm not surprised. Yeah, I'm yeah. Not surprised because, you know, the government is bugged by all these decentralized little blogs that are popping up because you can do whatever you want right yeah and so they they want to find a way to classify you as something someone that is doing something that needs to be regulated right so you're a journalist now or you're you know you're 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 someone that can, they can regulate if you have a thousand hits we can regulate you yeah well which is interesting because it, it's sort of <laughs> funny where we're approaching this point and and i think this is interesting too because um you know, in the world you and I grew up in, I mean, I was, you know, born in the 1970s and whatnot. We sort of entered into this world where, say, in Canada, there was Bell Canada. There was this sort of government agency that controlled all the phones. Right. We, we grew up in this world where pretty much we had come to this point where everything was controlled by the government. Right. To some extent. Right. Like we have our own sort of Canadian broadcasting standards organization that would uh, sort of govern what was published on the airwaves. Of radio, right? And and a little while ago, they struck they struck out at uh, Dire Straits because uh, somebody complained about the word faggot 
being used. Right, in, well, I heard about that. That's right. Yeah, uh, money for nothing and checks for free. Well, I, I, I remember, uh, I think, Pink Floyd's, uh, you know, We Don't Need No Education song, right? was was actually <laughs> banned in Britain in the, you know, 20 years ago because it, <laughs> you know, it cast aspersions upon the, you know, British industry. And in, in my hometown of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, when I was a kid, I yeah. remember Monty Python's Life of Brian was banned from Baton Rouge by the district attorney ah. just on, on Christian grounds. I mean, I don't think they could get away with that now, but it was incredible. So we had to wait two years for it to show up on the midnight movies, ah, excellent. which is apparently dangerous now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so which is, what is funny is though, is, is that we're seeing the system now where you and I sort of grew up in these, these places where everything was controlled, but then sort of the, the internet exploded and, I think because it wasn't classified by the government, they didn't know what to do with it. I agree. Sort of, and now, um, you know, 10 years, for the last 10 years, I think they've really been trying to play catch up. Yes. With the Internet. Yes, I agree completely. And, uh, and, and the worst nation of all is the U.S., of course, uh, the most powerful and the most controlling and the most hypocritical because you'll have Hillary Clinton saying that w the America wants to defect, you know, defend internet freedom mm -hmm. while we're the country that is cracking down on all these uses of the internet for uh, exporting secrets and child pornography intellectual property uh, etc gambling so it's completely hip hypocritical and so yes they are scrambling to try to find it and plus imposing taxes on it sales taxes mm -hmm. other other kinds of taxes so um it's under it's under siege because it's a free enclave outside of the government's control, largely. But I think it will stay outside of the government's control because it's digital. It's a realm that they can't understand. It's free. It's asynchronous. It's spontaneous, decentralized, and and there's encryption if you need it. People don't well, use it now because it's inconvenient, but they will use it if they have to. Well, what I also think is interesting is that um, what I think is what is sort of good about it is that. It's come to the point where, um, you know, since, let's say, 1995 to here to 2000, 2012, it has so now dominated the economy that I think if they were really to try to shut it down, you would seriously damage yeah. what is left of the yeah. functioning sort of capitalistic economy within the United States and even within the world. Yes, I think they know right? that. I think they see that. You know, and, and because I have, uh, you know, I have friends who work in China, uh, you know, a friend of mine, he lives in China for six months at a time working on various product developments. And, you know, there's this great firewall of China. Right. But basically, he said it's fairly easy if you're in China to get a VPN, a virtual private network. Right. And anybody who works in a company that has a VPN can access the entire Internet. Right. Completely unblocked. Right. Well, except... I would agree with that, except you have to tunnel to somewhere. So you tunnel to the U.S., but if you're in the U.S., there's some – I mean, uh, a friend of mine sent me a video from the BBC on the Olympics the other day, and I couldn't watch it, right? Because <laughs> – so I've got to have a VPN back to, to you know, UK or something. So no, but yeah. I agree. There, there's ways to get out, yes. Yeah, well, you, you have now things like Tor, um, you know what I mean, like these anonymizer services and yeah. whatnot. Um and to some extent, I think that the that the private organizations uh, they don't necessarily uh, they don't necessarily have the interest in really trying to actually sniff every single packet. No, they you know what I mean. Right, right. They can't, they. I mean, if you would if you look at an organization like you know here in Canada we have Rogers, say you know Rogers or Bell Communications or something like that, and we we here in Canada also have that same situation where we had a you know these virtual essentially these, these virtual government sort of created monopolies over certain types of communication, um, but to some extent I mean you know you know their main business is providing communications technology communications abilities to their customers right. You know, they don't necessarily want to be involved in, you know, in, you know, creating the manpower, creating the the technology necessary to sniff every single packet. Right. Like that's not that that actually goes against their their actual business interests. Right. I agree. Mm -hmm. it, it's against their basic business model, but they also live in a world where there's the government. 
they have to please, yeah. the, please the local officials, right? So if the government insists they put in a sniffer or a system, they have to do a, a calculation to decide whether it's worth it or not. And too often they do, I believe. Yeah. And then, so, but, but, but back to net neutrality, um, who was, uh, so who's sort of attacking, so net neutrality is being passed, or it's, or it's a bill that's being passed by the Congress or the Senate? I think it's an FCC rule that's being proposed. So okay. it's, 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 it's inside baseball, it's complicated, but, um, so the FCC has a certain jurisdictional mandate because of, given by congressional legislation. And, mm -hmm. The, the argument is whether they have ancillary jurisdiction to regulate things that are not quite given to them directly. So, and then the, the secondary argument is whether, uh, or maybe the primary argument is whether this rule, whether it's uh, given to them or not, the power to do it is constitutional. In other words, the primary argument of the Cato Institute and the tech freedom groups and the other amici, uh, the amici uh, parties on the, uh, on the brief is that uh, for the federal government to tell a provider they have to allow certain content would be, number one, a violation of freedom of speech because they're being forced to carry things they don't agree with. Number two, it's a taking under the Fifth Amendment. In other words, you're telling them how they can use their property, or rather you're giving someone else a, basically an easement, saying someone can use their pipes, their cables without their permission, and you're not compensating them. So that's a taking of private property without compensation. So there are two constitutional arguments that they're arguing. Uh, I have no idea whether they're going to make it or not. I think there is some chance they'll succeed, but given the history of regulation in this country, I'm not confident that they'll win. Yeah. And what I also thought was interesting is that uh, one of the, I guess, you know, quote-unquote, the founders of the net – uh, I mean, apart from Al Gore, obviously, um, was a man, uh, and he sort of was for net neutrality. And I think I think we were we had a brief conversation before yeah. this talking about sort of utilitarian arguments about this. And, I think it's if, if I, remember, I think it's Vint Cerf, and he's one of the founders of the IP TCP protocol that is the backbone of the internet. Um, and yes, of course. So his opinion is that this is not a big deal. The government sh has the right to come in and do this, but I don't see the point. I mean, so so what? The, the opinion of one guy who's good in technology, so he's a quasi-socialist. So what? <laughs> I mean, so he's <laughs> supposed to be an expert witness or on on what's legitimate. Um, so um, I just think he's wrong. I think he he's 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 value he's he's uh, he's estimating these things on un ad hoc utilitarian considerations, and he's assuming the government is there to help us. And mm -hmm. He's wrong. I mean, the government is there to regulate us and to control us, and um, um, I think it is an affront to human dignity and liberty, and it is a threat to the most important tool humans have ever had to fight the government, which is the internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is communication and knowledge and awareness and being connected and spreading ideas that we can shine the light on these cockroaches that control us. And that is why they want to shut it down or regulate it. So I think this is the most important fight we have. And so I disagree with anyone who thinks that the government has any role whatsoever, a justified role in regulating the Internet. Uh, yeah. The government should stay the hell out of it and leave us alone. Yeah, well, and, and this is this is kind of interesting, too, because we're at this sort of turning point again. Um, you know, it goes back to the original printing press. Right. Yes. It goes back to the it, it's funny because it we're sort of reliving uh, these fights all over again, um, you know, that happened when the first printing press was created, when all of a sudden knowledge could be spread. Uh, yeah. And right yeah. Then, and, yes. You're, and, and what happens, the, the parallels are actually amazing because what's happening now is that the government is using intellectual property law, primarily copyright, as an excuse to censor speech on the Internet. Mm -hmm. um, which is this tool that they fear. And copyright arose from the reaction to the printing press in the first place. The printing press arose, and it was a big threat to the church and to the state because mm -hmm. they didn't want people reading things the government didn't control. So the yeah. government 
you know, gave authority to these quasi-authorized institutions. The church did too. The scribes, you know, the uh, uh, and then the printing guild was established with the stationers guild. Um, and so basically you had the government and the church collaborating to establish a monopoly over who had the right to publish books. Um, and that is what copyright came from. But what is uh, a little bit perverse is that the reason that authors were in favor of copyright with the Statute of Anne, 1709, was that it was a way to give them the right to decide who got to publish their own works. Instead of the, the, you know, the printing guilds, the authors could decide. So they didn't want this right, the copyright. They didn't want the right to prevent people from reading their works. They wanted the right so that they would not have anyone else veto their right to publish their own damn books. <laughs> so if you think about it, copyright was originally popular among artists because it liberated them from government control and censorship. It liberated their works. It spread them out to everyone. And so nowadays, copyright is being used to stop people from being – Reading what they want to read or publishing what they want to publish. Interesting, but what was? But wasn't it the right of copy like the king would grant the right to copy a work? Yeah, and yeah. Or, or well, or, well, th that's more of a patent thing. So the king would grant oh, okay. like an exclusive monopoly over a given product in a given region. The, oh, okay. the right to copy was more of a of a guild kind of thing. In other words. The scribes control that only the – well, it wasn't easy to print these things out. The scribes were doing it, and then the, the Gutenberg printing press came along, right? And so mm -hmm. you would have these guilds would authorize I mean, uh, what books could come out. This is why you know Galileo had all of his problems. <laughs> Otherwise, he, I mean he was smuggling manuscripts out to people in Amsterdam and things like this so they can get, get it out there. Um, so it was uh, – I'm sure the, the, the crown had some influence over it, but it was more of a guild – control thing what do we want people to hear okay and now we we have that same issue today with i guess i guess a, a place like wikileaks or something like that why do people not have the right to view certain materials right and so the so the government comes over the you know the government has been forced to recognize that people have this right to freedom of the press or right to freedom of speech or mm -hmm. right to freedom of religion or right to conscience they recognize this in abstract, but they come up with all these exceptions, right? Like if there's national security in, on the line, or if there's yeah. copyright being violated, et cetera, or if there's child pornography, or if there's being crimes being advocated. So they have all these exceptions that give them the right to come in and say, well, there's no freedom of expression here. And so, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. What was Kim.com site? The guy in uh, in New Zealand or Australia, it was a me mega mega upload, right? Yeah, mega just upload. Just shut down. Yeah. I mean, just – this is – I think it was New Zealand. Yeah, it was news. He was – well, I think his servers were in Hong Kong, and he lived in New Zealand. But then I guess New Zealand police or whoever went to his compound. No, but, it, but that's the point. It wasn't New Zealand police. It was like this huge operation of like 49, you know – personnel most uh, of which were american like fbi hong kong people and some yeah. local in some no, some local new zealand bootlickers and uh they invaded this guy's estate and and i mean look there's this guy richard dwyer which is a horrible case this this english college student who is being extradited to the united states by the british courts on criminal fines for having a website in England that was legal under English law, British law, um, because it had links, links to other sites that had copyrighted material stored on them. So this guy may be – he may lose his, his life. His whole education is going to be ruined. He'll maybe go to jail in the U.S. for having a website in England. So these laws are being used – in a police state fashion, it's it's truly horrific. Yeah, as I understand it, the Canadian government itself had, uh, I think, also incorporated one of these things, uh, which would include links to copyrighted material, which, of course, basically um, which, enables well, them to get you to just about just just about makes everyone a criminal. No, well, not only that, it's it, it means that a court case discussing this would be criminal because. You know, you have to 
put in your court pleadings the links. <laughs> you have to explain what the crime is, right? You have to give evidence. Yeah. So that means in the public record, there is the, so the public record is now a criminal accomplice to this because you're explaining how to do this. So um, it's totally hypocritical. Yeah, well, well, from a from a broad perspective, um, you know, I, I think a friend of mine, uh, Pridrag Ratzik, he said he grew up in uh, Yugoslavia and he said there was a saying for everyone there is a law. Um, yes. You know, and, uh, you know, here in here in Ontario, our official highway speed is 100 kilometers an hour. Right. But the average the average speed is, let's say, 117 right. kilometers an hour or something like that. What, what's yours? The, oh, I, I live in Ontario. <laughs> well, yeah, no. Well, it is. Yeah, no. It's, no, say so what's your average speed? Close to 120, I'd say. There you go. But, but that's what it is, right? I mean, everybody, the average speed is 120, but when everyone drives 120, that means that any individual can be pulled over at any reason, right? You know, the, the basic reason is that you were breaking the speed limit. Um, but the, the real reason might be something else. Yeah, it gives the cops discretion to pull over whoever they want, and then they can use that as a pretense. Yeah, and that was the class, that was a classic... Um, uh, there's the book, I guess, that came out a couple of years ago in the United States called Three Felonies a Day, where it describes the idea that uh, every, pretty much every American is committing three felonies a day, whether they know it or not. I, I should be surprised if that's – I mean, that seems – look, I've read studies. Um, if you just look at copyright alone, there's a study mm -hmm. by some law professors which estimates the average amount of fines that the average person – who uses the internet on a daily basis like you and I do, how mm. much are you liable for under copyright law? And it's like $4 billion a year, <laughs> a year per person, I mean, yeah. literally. And that's just the civil penalties. God knows what the, the criminal pen, I mean, penalties are. So I agree with you that these laws um, – look, there's a great book, a classic book by Bruno, by Bruno Leone called Freedom and the Law. I don't know if you read it, but um, – mm back in the 50s or 60s from Italy. And this guy's talking about how when you have l legislation, this is basically the problem, is the idea of legislation. The mm -hmm. idea that we make law by a group of people just pronouncing edicts and that becomes the law. It's totally artificial. It could be anything that they say. And when you have that way of making law as opposed to the common law or a decentralized or a spontaneous or a traditional or a custom-based or a natural way of making law. Mm -hmm. You just have a group of people who can announce what the law is, which is what legislation is. Then you have um, a proliferation of laws. You have so many laws that no one can avoid being a lawbreaker. He mm -hmm. talks about this in his book about how not only is the danger that the government now has the power to pick and choose and you know focus on whoever they want. Because everyone's a lawbreaker now, right? Mm -hmm. But not only that, but the entire idea of being a law-abiding citizen becomes discredited. I mean everyone starts laughing at it in private because they know it's bullshit, Yeah. right? Because they know that if you're a lawbreaker, all it means is you broke a law that the government said you shouldn't break. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, whereas mm -hmm. in the old system, law tends to be correlated with being bad. I mean, with being good or bad, right? I mean, if you're a lawbreaker, you're evil or you're wrong or you're bad, you're dangerous. Um, so the entire idea of the government legislating law is really the fundamental problem here. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, and and for myself, I mean, from a very early age, I think that I think that's what me that's what made me sort of like. Um, either disrespect the law to some extent or or just understand that it really was a farce you know what i mean yes. for the very fact that you're a you're a teenager and you're smoking pot and right like, yeah the rules are arbitrary right or statutory rape like if you're 17 yeah. if you're 18 years old and you have a 17 year old girlfriend or 16 and you have sex then you're a statutory rapist whereas you weren't yeah. whereas you weren't a month before yeah, or, or even something – I think to some extent I think in, in you know sort of American history and Canadian history, I think the most obvious one was um, uh, alcohol. Yes. You know, alcohol prohibition. Yes. Which was just you – know, Yes, just, ridiculous. Yeah, like just on its on this ball face. And, and this is why sometimes I call uh, America uh, Iran light. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I agree. It's insane.
<laughs> you know, like literally, like, like honestly, like the, the idea, and this is what I, I would say to people. I said, imagine, you know, 70 years ago or 80 years ago that alcohol actually was illegal. No, can, well, you imagine, well, can you imagine but, but the yes, world? But we, right now, marijuana is illegal. That's, that's, that's <laughs> the point. Even in Canada. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, I mean, yeah. I agree. It seems like barbaric times. People think of America and, you know, the, the Western Hemisphere is this, and, your, you know, Western, the West basically is this enlightened, sophisticated, Europe, you know, society. But we had a civil war here that killed 500,000 people, right? Mm -hmm. We had slavery here. We nuked Japan, yeah, I mean, and I say we. I don't want to join myself in the we, but the Americans did this. Um, they the American, well, the American ruling class, whatever you want to define. The, it as they a. put the Japanese Americans in concentration camps. Yeah, right, and and we had prohibition. It was ridiculous, and everyone forgets this. Yeah, they just forget it. They think, oh no, that's all in the past. It's the old days, and yet we still have three million, seven million people in jail today for. For, for drug crimes. It's, it's obscene. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what I sort of said. I said, well, I, I, I thought the one, the one, uh, the one sort of positive point was somebody, I guess the New Yorker had, had sort of a piece where it said, you know, there's more, there's more people in American prisons today than there was in the Soviet gulags. But, you know, to be fair, in the Soviet gulags, they were executing them on a regular basis. So, you know, so the, so the roll through in Soviet gulags was a lot more. <laughs> the American prison system. But yeah, no, I, I fully agree with you. So I guess the question is, when are you leaving the United States of America? <laughs> Tell me a better place to go to. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard Singapore is pretty good. Yeah, you know, I'm looking around. We'll see. We'll see. I'm not, I'm well, not let, stuck here. You know, like, I'm from Louisiana and yeah. I live in Houston now. And Houston actually just got voted the uh, coolest city in America by Forbes. <laughs> right, which is not is is the total nonsense. But yeah, uh, I happen to live here now. I have a career here, and people say, "How do you like Houston?" I say, "Yeah, it's a place to live." Yeah, I mean, I'm not stuck here. I don't, I, I don't love it. It's just a place to live, and I actually view the U.S. like that. Yeah, and I view I view well, the West like that. I mean, it's just a place to live, but they have their hooks in you. Um, but you know, I'll get out if I can when I when the time is right. We'll see. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'll tell you, um, to be honest, we don't really enforce our marijuana laws all that much here in Canada. So, uh, <laughs> well, you know, that, that's, uh, that's something. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, but, but I hear you, you know, have a hell of a waiting time for hip replacements. Yeah, well, but of course you, you can leave, uh, but you know, you can, take, you can drink, you can smoke marijuana while you're waiting 18 months for your hip replacement surgery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but, but you're free to, you're free to leave the country to get a hip replacement. There so, you go. So as long as you view the world as this sort of like this, this one sort of one world government, you know, yeah, there's, there's lesser jurisdictions of, uh, of, uh, of pain and, and greater jurisdictions of true, pain. True, true. But, um, but yeah, so net neutrality. Uh, I guess is there anything you want to sum up? Is there is there any particular point of view you had from? Uh, I would I would say that the, the 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 basic idea is that you cannot side with the government, which has created the problems in the first place to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. The fundamental free free market position is that you have to get the government out of it as much as possible and let competition operate. Yeah. yeah, well, that and and just to to sum up, I mean, there was there was an interesting fight a little while ago um, here in Canada because um, uh, what what's is what is actually kind of interesting is that we had a we had basically a government monopoly on uh, phone service, uh, right? So there was Bell Canada, which was you know owned by the Canadian government and provided phone service across <laughs> across Canada, and in the 1990s they actually started liberalizing it, right? We start, first we started to allow other other organizations to um, sort of use, and and this was and this is the interesting thing about, um, and and just actually to sort of touch on another point, because when you when you've got these situations where the government has created a monopoly, and this was sort of the problem in the old Soviet Union, right? How do you unwind this situation? Right. Right. And and the thing that the uh, that the Canadian government had done um, was they would say, okay, okay, we've got this government monopoly system 
of, of phone lines, right? And so they said, okay, we've created this problem. We're going to help solve it. And so what we're in part of what we're going to do is we're going to allow, we're going to force this essentially government company to rent out its lines right. to co other companies at a certain rate right. for a certain period of time right. in order that they can actually get to the point where they can compete. Right. Right. And, and they actually had that here and, and, and most recently what they've been doing is now they've been doing it. And, and of course, um, with cable, we had the same problem, right? Where certain companies were get, granted monopolies over certain geographical areas. Um, and, uh, and we had this issue recently where the government was going to repeal this system where, um, say, Rogers or Bell would be providing uh, bandwidth for Internet service. But then the government would force... Uh, other com would force them to provide other companies with bandwidth at a price lower than right. the market rate, and then they would then charge. And the idea was that these companies would, would eventually gain enough capital that they would either install their own lines or right. be able to, to be compete. Uh, and, you know, 10, day, 10 years down the line, the government's going to repeal it. And to my mind, I had some problems with it, right? Because I sort of had this issue where, Okay, well, imagine if there's a, uh, a gas, you know, there's a, there's a gas company, mm -hmm. right, or, uh, that provides gasoline to cars, and they have a filling station, and then the government forces them to take one of their filling stops and forces them to sell the gasoline that's in that filling stop, that one little thing, to somebody at a, at a price lower, and then they can then undercut the price of the person who originally had to rent, who had to originally sell that gas to them. Right. You know what I mean? And it, that law was about to be repealed. And it had been a number of years. So these companies could have had a chance. They would have had a real chance to actually produce, you know, to actually save some capital and invest and whatnot. And, and, and I sort of said, well, listen, I mean, at a certain point, why should these companies have to be – why should these companies be forced to provide this bandwidth at a lower price? Right. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on that whole – like it, it's sort of a problem of how do you unwind these government monopolies? I mean we actually have things like that here in the U.S. Uh, with energy, for example, energy yeah. um, electricity companies. You know, I mean this is common with these um, public utilities that the government – Right. I mean, look, the way to unwind it – I mean Murray Rothbard's written on this before for New Liberty and I think Ethics of Liberty – if you really want to unwind it, you just privatize it. And the way to privatize it – actually, the argument is that it doesn't matter how you privatize it. Just get okay. it out of the government's hands. But yeah. I don't think these are serious privatization plans. I mean the right way to do it is just to give it up to the private market somehow. Auction it off. Give it to the current people using it. It doesn't matter, but just let it go. And even though there will be a quasi-monopoly for a few years because you helped to set it up, just get the hell out of the way and stop – making the problem worse there is no way you can look my, my, my view is i'm very cynical or realistic whatever you call it the government is good at only two things destruction mm. and propaganda i used yeah. to believe they're good at destruction only but they're actually good at propaganda because <laughs> if they weren't good at propaganda they wouldn't exist yeah because they delude people into believing that they're necessary right so the government is only good at destroying things and propagandizing people that's mm. it that, that means they're not good at deregulating things. They're not good at setting up the new alternatives. They're not good at privatizing. They're not good at anything. So get out of it as soon as possible. The problem yeah. is the government. So I would say whatever strategy you can come up with where you get the government out of it as soon as possible and just let the free market finally reassert itself, even if it takes 10, 20 years for these monopolies to kind of lose their power and reorganize and merge and split up or whatever, just do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Stefan, um, or Stefan, I should say. Uh, this has been very enjoyable. It's uh, it's been a little while since we chatted, but uh, I think we're going to do this again. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Anytime you want to visit Toronto, uh, come on up. I'd like to do it. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks, Rodman. Okay. Bye.